now, now everybody's here. So let's get started. Fortunately, I'm not in the hospital today, so that's nice. So I can give the uh, talk with my cat. Um, so we're going to pick up where we left off from yesterday, talking about the healthcare sector um, more broadly. You can still see my screen, right? Excellent. Uh, so when we last left our intrepid heroes, we were talking about types of hospitals. So we had gone through basically all of these, gotten up to type of care provided, um, where we were sort of talking a little bit about cancer specialty hospitals, orthopedic specialty hospitals, et cetera. And the, the, the one sort of elephant in the room that we haven't delved into too much was profit status. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit now. So for-profit hospitals, their objective is to make money, which should be sort of obvious, right? Um, and then once they make money, they can distribute money to their various and sundry shareholders, whereas not-for-profit, um, in general, the goals of not-for-profit organizations are to serve the goals of the members of the nonprofit, um, and all money earned goes right back into operations. So they don't technically have a profit. Um, any excess revenue that they have, the expectation is that that goes back into um, uh, capital development or it goes back into the community or what have you. So um, just give this a thumbs up. Hang on. And so um, the other the other thing that's important about not not for profits is they can be tax exempt, which means that they don't have to pay taxes um, as well. And that's not for profit. And then there's the concept of the nonprofit, which is not the same as the not for profit, although the words are confusing. And there, truly, their goal is to serve the public good. They are tax exempt. Um, all donations to them are tax deductible, and they have to publicly report everything. And so, in general, hospitals fall into the nonprofit category, although they could also be not for profit, depending on how they're structured. These are sort of semantic y things, but what I found when I was looking into the hospital sector more broadly is that people use the word not for profit and nonprofit somewhat interchangeably. And I only call that out because they are not the same. Um, but People in this business use them interchangeably because we are doctors and not nonprofit business people, and we don't know what we are talking about. So there we are. Um, fast facts on U.S. hospitals. This is fairly up to date. This is from the American Hospital Association. The majority of community hospitals are actually not for profit. And again, they're using that as not for profit, but they could also mean nonprofit, right? Um, and so that means non governmental, not for profit hospitals. Uh, about 24% of, or about a quarter of hospitals are actually investor-owned for-profit hospitals, and about 20% of hospitals are uh, associated with state and local government. So these are these safety net hospitals that we talked about yesterday, county hospitals, public hospitals, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things that we've seen huge growth in is the for-profit hospital industry as an opportunity for people to make money. And so how does profit status impact hospital function. And so I kind of summarize that a little bit on this slide. Nonprofit hospitals are generally service oriented. So they will care for everybody based on need. They often lose money um, because when you're taking care of anybody based on need, that often means they're not able to pay for their health care and they don't have health insurance. Um, they have community members on their board. Um, they have public reporting. So you can look up for any nonprofit entity all of their like books are publicly reportable and you can look that up yourself on the web. Um, all money that they make goes back into the hospital. They're typically vested long-term in the health of the community that they're serving. Whereas a for-profit, um, a few things, they're profit-oriented, they wanna maximize revenue, they do have to pay taxes um, and they're focusing on the bottom line all the time, right? They often use financial incentives to optimize revenue and minimize costs. Um, some of the things like we talked a little bit about yesterday, like pay for performance schemes or, or some of these value-based schemes. Um, they have access to capital, which nonprofits don't. And what does that mean? That means that a for-profit can, you know, call up some venture capital company and be like, hey, I need money, but I promise you this return down the road. 
that is a vast oversimplification of how this works, but they potentially have access to that in a way that nonprofits don't. Um, and a for-profit can just close if they're not making money. They are not sort of obliged to serve the community. They're not kept afloat by a public stream of money, for instance. Um, if they're not making money, they can just close. Uh, they don't have to publicly report anything and they can choose for whom they care, right? So they can choose like, like the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, won't accept Medicare, won't accept Medicaid. You can do that, right? If you're a for-profit hospital um, or you can, you know, so they're both choosing uh, based on insurance, but also they're only gonna care for cancer patients, right? So, um, so that's very much sort of a different model compared to uh, the nonprofits. And so we've seen massive growth in the for-profit um, uh, uh, sort of sector within healthcare more broadly. So we're talking about hospitals and in general, um, for-profits often focus on specialty hospitals as opposed to just general ones because the specialty ones are often doing the things that make a lot of money. So surgeries, cancer treatment, you know, heart stuff, et cetera. Whereas a general hospital seeing everybody will also be seeing the things that don't make any money, like kids or mental health patients um, or patients with HIV or addiction. You know, like these are, are medical problems that are not very lucrative to care for and are super, but are super resource intensive to care for. Um, we're seeing uh, incursion into hospice, home care, skilled nursing facilities. Dialysis is nearly 100% for profit at this point, um, which I think is, is, is pretty wild. So, you know, and there's a lot of profits to be had more broadly within the health insurance industry, right? We see it in a lot of things. This is 2022 data. Um, pharmaceuticals, had never had profits like this, but then with the development of some of the drugs for COVID and some of those therapies, we saw uh, some profits kind of going through the roof. But you can see billions and billions and billions of dollars in profit sort of across the board there. Now, um, one of the things that's interesting is that if you're a doc working for a for-profit either hospital or practice, um, you're more likely to be taking money also from ph pharmaceutical companies. So what does that mean? You know, there's been a, a a real rise in saying, hey, docs, don't take money from the pharmaceutical industry. Don't take free lunches from the pharmaceutical industry. Don't go to those free steak dinners from the pharmaceutical industry where they tell you all about their product and want you to prescribe it because that compromises your ethics. Right. And so one of the things we find is that doctors at these kinds of facilities who are interested in making money are more likely to take. Uh, pharmaceutical money as well. And the implication in this is, of course, that that may be biasing the way that they provide care. Um, back when I was a medical student in the early 2000s, um, all of our lunches were paid for by, by different drug companies. And they didn't stand up there and tell us to prescribe Zosin or whatever. But, um, but you know, certainly there was the opportunity for uh, that there. And unfortunately, now there's there's most most academic centers, most hospitals don't have free lunches for med medical students and residents provided by the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, I say it sort of tongue in cheek. It's probably a good thing that they're not there, but the the you know, but the free food was nice. Especially now that I am a program director for an internal medicine program, I wish that we could tap into that sweet pharma money, but I can't, and that's fine. I don't want to compromise the ethics of my learners. Um, so. You know, if you look at uh, the the sort of incursion of profit within the healthcare industry, this is a, a a pretty wild slide. And again, this goes back to COVID, right? Regeneron had these crazy antibody therapies that that people used for a while during the pandemic, and uh, you can you can believe that that guy made a lot of money in the course of that, right? Um, but lots of other so Oak Street Health is a primary care company that basically is trying to make money off of value-based care stuff. Cigna is an insurance company. Um, you know, some of these are, are basically biotechs as well. So lots and lots of money going to CEOs. Um, some would argue that this is excessive. I, you know, I, I guess I'll sort of let the numbers speak for themselves and you can decide if it's excessive. Um, if you look at their, um, uh, you know, like, like the amount of the C-suite um, salaries are just, you know, just sort of crazy, like hundreds of millions of dollars from these companies within the insurance companies. So um, really, it's just just a tremendous amount of money. 
And I would make the argument that this is money that isn't making people better, right? So, so when you when you have the national health insurance run by the government, the government isn't paying people two hundred million dollars in order to run that program, right? Uh, I mean, yes, the person that's in charge of CMS, which is um, Becerra, you know. I imagine he makes a good salary. I can't imagine it's more than a million dollars because he's working for the government. Like the government don't got that kind of money. And, you know, people don't want to see the government paying people crazy amounts of money. Like this can only happen when you're trying to run a for profit. Now, these folks will say, oh, but we want to attract the best and brightest talent and most innovative and blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, whatever. I, I, you know, this is a consequence of what happens when um, profit sort of drives things. You get all, all this money going into that, really going into effective healthcare, especially if you acknowledge that the government funded healthcare, like traditional Medicare or VA, provides comparable outcomes to you know, he- you know, healthy insured patients or you know, patients getting health insurance from, from some of these private companies. So um, one question that often comes up, why is dialysis almost entirely for profit? Well, this is an example of advocacy. Uh, and since 1972, um, thanks to a combination of lobbying and, and technological advancements, like the development of dialysis, so this is more than 50 years now, all patients that have in-stage renal disease are eligible for Medicare. doesn't matter how old you are. So if you have a, a you know, 19-year-old kid who developed kidney failure because of Alports, or you know they had Wilms tumors and had to have their kidneys taken out. Now they have end-stage renal disease. They qualify for Medicare, um, and this was a good thing because at the time there were all these people that needed dialysis. Dialysis was expensive. Private insurance companies were like, "Hell no, we're not going to cover them because they cost too much money, right?" And so the government stepped in and said, "Okay." we will cover everybody with end-stage kidney disease so that they can get their dialysis. Sounds great, right? Well, now every single dialysis patient has a form of insurance that can pay for those three times a week dialysis sessions, right? And so you can open up a dialysis center and the more patients that you can get in there to do dialysis, the more money you get, you make, right? Because you get paid on a per patient basis. And if you maximize your economies of scale, you just line them right up and hook them all up to their machines and just boom, 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 boom. You can get all of these people in there. It's a guaranteed payer because they either have Medicare or Medicare Advantage. So you will always get paid. Like you're not going to have to deal with private insurance companies, which are like, well, we did not prior authorize that dialysis or, well, you didn't get dialysis at the single place that we contract with. You're getting it, you know, so they they create these barriers and and delays in reimbursing for the care that they're supposed to provide. Medicare doesn't engage in any of that. And so you get to open a dialysis center, know that you're going to get a sweet paycheck regularly every week from Medicare to cover your costs. That's a great way to try and find a way to make as much money as you possibly can. Um, But of course, the for-profit dialysis clinics actually do a a less good job by many metrics, right? So death rates, this was a meta-analysis from a couple of years ago, looking at outcomes comparing for-profit or not-for-profit dialysis clinics. And at the end of the day, it it strongly favors the not-for-profits. Um, death rates are higher for patients that get their care through these for-profit dialysis clinics. Um, if you look at, at, at profit status in terms of what the hospital owns, you're more likely at a for-profit hospital to be offered a profitable service. So what does that mean? Let's say that um, you know, you're getting your care through a for-profit and they say, you know, it's time for your colon cancer screening. We should make sure that you get your colonoscopy. But if you're getting your care through a government healthcare system, they may say, look, why don't we just do the home stool cards? We'll just screen for blood in your poop. That's also an effective way of screening for colon cancer. So they'll do that. So guess which one pays way, way better, right? The colonoscopy, because it's a procedure. So there's all these opportunities for revenue to come in from uh, whoever the payer is, if you're a for-profit company. And so you're always going to offer the colonoscopy because you're always going to smell an opportunity to make more money compared to a government hospital that might offer stool cards. And 
I, I saw this, you know, in my practice as a resident, you know, we, I spent some of my time in a free clinic, some of my time in a private clinic. And, and I spent some of my time in a county hospital, some of my time in a private hospital. You absolutely saw at the private hospital, it was all colonoscopies all the time. In the, in the resource strapped clinics, they would get stool cards and, you know, and would only be able to get a colonoscopy if they needed one to, to you know, to figure out what was going on with them rather than for screening for colon cancer. Um, and so you can see this sort of across the board. If there's, uh, if there's a profitable service, you're more likely to be offered it if your hospital is a for-profit hospital. Um, unfortunately, they're also more likely to deliver um, low value care. And this is, this is basically um, one way, this is from a, a, another study a couple of years ago, trying to look at overuse of healthcare resources versus underuse. And it turns out that for-profits and larger systems tend to deliver um, more overuse as established by, boy, you really don't need to do this, do you? Um, versus these major teaching hospitals or primary care clinics are much less likely to overuse care. So it's another surrogate for um, making decisions that result in more potential revenue. Um, For-profit hospitals also have higher death rates. Again, this is a, another pooled meta-analysis. This one's actually pretty old um, and basically showed that, that for-profit hospitals uh, were more likely to, you're more likely to die at one. So uh, they cost more. So this is perhaps not surprising when their reason for functioning is to make money for shareholders. They're again, going to optimize revenue. That means that more money is gonna flow through them they are going to end up being more expensive. Uh, there'll be more payments to those hospitals compared to uh, the not-for-profit hospitals. Um, their administrative costs are higher. So investor-owned hospitals have uh, are spending 30 cents uh, you know, uh, of their revenue on administration costs, again, compared to nonprofit or public hospitals, or we just threw Canada on there for fun. You can see it's very cheap to run a hospital in Canada compared to the United States. Um, For-profit hospitals have the highest readmission rates for every condition that you could look at. So in yellow are the non-profit non hospitals, green are the public hospitals, red are the for-profit hospitals. Readmission is a metric um, now used as a way of determining how, how quality is your care, how high is the quality of your care at the hospital. And so um, 30 day readmission rates are now tracked by insurance companies, by Medicare, because if you got readmitted after your pneumonia hospitalization, yeah, that suggests maybe we messed, maybe we didn't take good care of you the first time around. Now, obviously, there are lots of patients that are very complicated, and you're never going to be able to avoid readmission because they're, you know, so called frequent flyers for any number of different reasons, right? Housing instability, food instability, unable to get their medications, et cetera, et cetera. But people have decided that readmission rates are a useful metric in this context. And yet here, for-profit hospitals are more likely to get you readmitted for pretty much everything that anybody looks at, whether it's uh, MIs, pneumonia, cabbage, COPD, exacerbations, joint replacements, heart failure. Um, so that's, that's not a very good indicator of the quality of their care. Um, they tend to avoid uh, unprofitable services. So for instance, HIV, not a big money maker, right? Um, and so for-profit healthcare systems are going to avoid providing HIV care if they can. Those medications can be expensive. The um, the um, like the comorbidities can be expensive. It's not easy to take care of those patients because you need specialists specialists engaged in that. So they simply avoid it. So, you know, out outpatient substance use disorder care. Only 6% of for-profit systems are, are going to be offering that. Psychiatry, you know, palliative care, like they're just not offering things if it doesn't represent an opportunity to make money, which again, begins to be a little bit unethical, right? Because then where are you going to get this kind of care? If the only hospital in your area is 15 miles away from you, but that's where the HIV service is, I guess that's where you're going to have to go, right? This is exacerbating inequities for people um, in their communities. Um, this was a wild one. This was a study done in Africa um, looking at the likelihood of offering um, appropriate dehydration therapy. So like oral rehydration fluid, like this is like 
Gatorade, or if you've ever hung out in, um, you know, any of these sort of under-resourced countries, um, one, diarrheal disease is a real problem there. And then two, the best way to treat it is through oral rehydration uh, uh, stuff. And the for-profits were less likely to offer oral rehydration therapy. They'd be more likely to actually try other things, right? Which might include admitting to the hospital because you can charge more, giving intravenous stuff, again, because you can charge more when, um, you know, that stuff is not necessarily as effective and it's certainly going to be more expensive. Um, and when you look at investor-owned nursing homes, um, there is clear evidence that they provide lower quality care. And again, this is like the number of deficiencies that Jayco finds when they come in and do their, um, when they come in and do their monitoring, much more likely to find deficiencies in for-profit nursing homes because again, you're gonna skimp on care. You're gonna skimp on services because that costs you more and eats into your profit margin. Um, hospice has gone increasingly for profit, which is pretty wild. Um, you know, and 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 this I find really bothersome, right? Because what is hospice care, but it's end of life care. And what they found is, can they find a way to make money on it? You know that you're gonna get paid for your hospice care, but then let's minimize you know, the, the amount of time that your nurses are spending with um, these hospice patients or assign a hospice nurse 20 different patients. So they have to go to all of these different patients rather than sort of being at the bedside, being responsive to the patient's needs. There are opportunities for profit in this and um, systems are certainly taking advantage of that. Um, unfortunately, for-profit hospices will not try, they will try to avoid the unprofitable patients. So um, so, for instance, if you have a patient who's been on chemo or who's been on TPN, parenteral nutrition, or who's getting tube feeds or maybe needing palliative radiation, those are all things that cost money that make things more complicated for those patients. For-profit hospices, avoid those patients because they don't want the additional complexity. Um, and this is kind of a, a, an interesting one. There are, this looks at the number of academics that serve on for-profit health corporation boards. And what you'll find is that there are a lot of high level academic physicians who you would think are just being academics and engaged in the search for truth and teaching and you know providing uh, high quality research and all of this. Many of them serve on these boards and these are paid these are paid board memberships. So they make money, additional money, by taking their name, their reputation, and, and also sitting on these boards. And it's hard to imagine that this wouldn't in some way influence the decisions that they make in how they run their hospitals in one way, shape, or form. Um, of course, these nonprofit health systems like Cleveland Clinic or, oh, look, Kaiser, where I work or Intermountain or Mayo, um, this is basically, they don't call it profit because they're not allowed to, right? They're nonprofits, but this is sort of like revenue minus expenses, which is all publicly reportable. Now, what do they do with those profits? Again, they're supposed to be reinvesting it in, uh, in the functions that they do, which may mean expansion, that may mean you know buying up other hospitals or whatever. So it's not supposed to be distributed to shareholder pockets. Um, it's supposed to be reinvested. But all of these are making money hand over fist, right? And it's hard to imagine that 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 that's not a driver for the decision making that they're doing. Um, unfortunately, they're getting into like the venture capital market, right? Many of these organizations that are non for profit, not for profit are getting into private equity. They're getting into hedge funds. They're putting all of that money into a lot of these, these sort of higher risk, high reward kind of investments. And, and so that seems like a betrayal of the concept of what a nonprofit hospital should be doing, right? Um, it seems like they're just trying to find ways to optimize the amount of money that they have. Now, now the other side is, of course, with money, they can do things to serve the community. And certainly that's what we should be expecting of them. 
But remember that these organizations, they also don't pay any taxes, right? So they're certainly not contributing to the tax base of the community. They certainly do employ lots of people within the communities, and we need them there in order to provide these you know, vital services. But it just seems like that's a ton of money that's going to just make more money and not necessarily to help all of the people that, that don't have access to care that they need right now. Um, these are just a bunch of individuals who are leaders of, you know, these major academic health systems and just how much money they get from the pharmaceutical industry. So again, there seems to be a lot of crossover here between profit, nonprofit, for-profit, um, people that you think should be somewhat objective, um, potentially uh, are not. So you know, it's sort of like they're acting more like for profits. Um, and so a couple of quotes I found, you know, profits and cash reserves will grow at these places, but their charity care does not. So when you look at the amount of charity care that they provide, that is sometimes uh, uh, more technically referred to as covering for people that can't pay, right? Uncompensated care. You know, you're seeing a lot all this money that they're making go way up, but you're seeing the amount of charity care they're providing sort of staying steady not going up proportionally, which means that they're not, you know, that even though they're nonprofits, they're, they should be serving the community. They're kind of not. Their decision-making seems to suggest that, you know, because if they really were, they would be increasing the amount of uncompensated care that they provide, right? The amount of charity care that they provide, and they're not doing, right? Um, this is an interesting article I read from 2020, how nonprofit hospitals get away with the biggest ripoff in America, whether it's buying up practices, excessive CEO salaries, um, you know, or overinflating charge master prices. So let me see. I think we want to talk a little bit about charge masters. The charge master is it's the it's the menu that the hospital has for how much they bill you for things. It is not. How much things cost, but there was a there was a law passed I think three years ago that said that hospitals needed to be transparent. They needed to tell you how much they were going to bill you for having your appendix out, for delivering a baby, for having open heart surgery for a heart attack. That all comes from the charge master, but those numbers on the charge master are totally made up. Like yes, you want to charge enough to cover the cost of doing whatever it is you do and keeping the lights on and the infrastructure and all that. But one thing that, that people have noticed when they look at charge masters from hospitals is like one hospital may bill you 5,000 for your appendectomy and another may bill you 20,000. And it's like the same procedure. You know, there shouldn't be that much variation. But of course, if you overinflate those prices, then that suggests that like that lets you manipulate the system to sort of say, oh, look at all the, the charitable care we're providing. We did this appendectomy for this patient. We didn't get paid for it. We would normally bill 20,000, even though the hospital down the street would normally bill 5,000. And even though it only costs you maybe $500, right? If you just look at the, at the cost of the system. So if you overinflate those prices, you make it look like you're doing a better job of providing charitable care than you are. And this is like the charge master, like they're like, oh, we want to be transparent. But like the only person that ever it gets billed that price is the person that can't pay. Because if you have insurance, your insurance company negotiates with the hospital to pay a lower amount. Right. And and if you can't pay, you can negotiate with the hospital to pay a lower amount. So it's only people paying cash that ever see that. And it's it's these are made up numbers. They don't reflect the actual cost to the system. And, you know, and people say, well. You should be able to shop around. You should be able to pick the hospital that you get your appendectomy at, at based on price or quality or whatever. But like, that's dumb. Because if you need your appendix out and you're sick, you're not out there being like, well, I don't think this is a very good hospital and they're going to charge me a lot. I'd like to be transferred to this hospital. Like that is, that, when you're sick, that you can't really engage in being a informed shopper, right? So um, it's, it, you know, but they these nonprofits engage in this because, these are some of the ways that they get away with sort of fleecing America. 
Um, I showed you this yesterday, the rise in hospital mergers that are happening. And this is another thing that nonprofits are engaging in, snatching up all of these other hospitals to, to build their networks. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and this is only getting worse. It was accelerated by COVID. So here's, a, I think, a, an amazing example, right? United Health Group. So United Health Group owns the largest health insurance company in the country. That's United Healthcare. And you can see what their numbers are. There are 26 million U.S. privately insured patients, about 20 million Medicare and Medicaid, 5 million around the world, 3 million just getting their drug coverage through them. But United Health Group also owns Optum. And you say, what's Optum? Well, Optum is the largest health uh, uh health, the largest employer of physicians in the nation, and they provide care to over 100 million patients. They also own Optum Insight, which is a consulting slash analytics data company, right? They also own Optum RX, which is a pharmacy benefit manager. So what you have under United Health Group is in effect, like all of it, the insurance company, the drugs, the data consulting, the healthcare delivery, and when they control everything, they can charge whatever they want to the system or to people or choose not to cover things. They could sit there and be like, well, we're going to take this new HIV medication and we're going to actually we're going to put all HIV medications in the highest copay uh, insurance plans. So if you have HIV, you're never going to want to go to United Health Group because you're going to have to pay the most out of pocket for those HIV drugs, for example. Right. And so or they'll take these biologic drugs. And they'll be like, yeah, we're not going to cover those. So then if you have somebody that needs a biologic that costs $15,000, $100,000 a year, United Health Group can just decide they're not going to cover it. And so you, tough beans if you have United Healthcare as your insurance provider, it's not going to cover what you need as a patient. Um, if you look at, at United Healthcare's health insurance revenues, um, they're, they're, the amount of money that they make from the private health insurance market has been pretty stable. It's gone up some, but the amount of money that they're making in the Medicare market, and this is through so-called Medicare Advantage, which is where the government takes money and gives it to United Healthcare to administer the Medicare program. They are that is an area of huge growth for them. Medicaid also an area of huge growth. How does that work? Remember, most states. They have a Medicaid program. Medicaid is the program for people under the federal poverty limit, usually 138%. Um, but most states have a contract with a private insurance company to administer the Medicaid program. And so again, these health insurance companies are looking at these government programs as cash cows because they can make a tremendous amount of money. And then when they don't deliver the care that they're supposed to, they just keep the money. And you know, people that are sick, it's too hard for them to fight back because who can fight when you're sick, right? Um, they're getting into the home health business, right? So this was now a couple of years old. Um, another example, CVS Health, right? CVS, they own the pharmacy, which is, you know, brick and mortar pharmacies, almost 10,000. They own the pharmacy benefits manager. They own the health insurance company through Aetna. They own the urgent care network, et cetera. Uh, they're also getting into the home health care business, right? So it's it's crazy how much merging there is going on across the health insurance industry. Oh, they're getting into primary care now, which again, nobody would think is a good idea because primary care doesn't make money. So how in the world are they going to make that work? You can't imagine, at least I can't imagine, that primary care delivered by CVS is, um, is going to be focused on me. Um, I think it's going to be focused on things that make the system money, but I, I don't think it's going to be focused on what's best for me because that's not what they're in the business of doing. Um, so, you know, you see more and more of these places where people are trying to create companies to to basically to basically profit. And, um, you know, it's just it's crazy how much this goes on. Um, you look at Walmart. Walmart now has a health insurance plan. They sell Medicare plans, Part D plans. They've partnered with Oak Street Health. They've acquired a telehealth company. So like all of these companies are getting into this business. This was one that was somewhat personal for me because I worked for Kaiser. This, this happened last year. Kaiser basically bought Geisinger. Geisinger was an integrated healthcare system in Pennsylvania. And, the, and this is not the Kaiser. This is the Kaiser that I work for, sort of. Again, I work for a physician group that has an exclusive contract with Kaiser, the insurance company. 
This is Kaiser, the insurance company going out and doing this, but not engaging Kaiser physicians in it. So it's really a, a totally different model from what the Kaiser integrated healthcare system is out here in the West. Who the heck knows what this is going to do, you know, but this is basically an insurance company trying to buy, buy and own the hospitals and the physicians. I'm just not sure that that's the right thing. Um, so coming back to this, uh, another fast fact on U.S. hospitals, two thirds of community hospitals now are system affiliated. Only 32 percent are independent. And the number of independents is just dropping, dropping, dropping. The number that are system affiliated is growing by leaps and bounds. This was some, an example that I found from the Chicago area of all the hospitals that had shut down within a 20 year period. All of these hospitals closed. And that means the hospitals that remain simply have to pick up the slack, right? And that's really, really, really difficult, um, especially if you live in these neighborhoods, because suddenly you no longer have access to a hospital. Um, and that's what's happening with all of this merging and all of this profit focus. Um, it's happening in rural hospitals. Um, you know, we, in spite of the fact that we create the critical access hospital designation, we continue to see large num numbers of rural hospitals closing uh, every year. Fortunately, during the pandemic, things settled down a little bit because um, there was additional money through the pandemic relief to, to help keep those hospitals open. But there's not really any reason to think that the numbers aren't going to start going up again since these don't make money. Um, why are they at risk of closing? <clears throat> you know, again, this was an article from <clears throat> last year that really looked at it. But the biggest reason they said persistent financial challenges related to patient services or depleted financial resources. This is this concept of risk. Hospitals are having to assume more risk because insurance companies aren't doing it anymore. They're saying, you know, we're going to engage in pay for performance schemes. We're only going to reimburse certain kinds of patients. And so when hospitals commit to taking care of everybody, you know, those that don't have insurance simply cost the hospital more money. Um, and those that come in sicker, sicker as often happens in rural hospitals because you don't have good health care access, you know, they cost the system more. And if the insurance companies don't pay them adequately enough or shift more risk onto the hospital, then the hospital is going to close. This is an interesting one, the number of, of healthcare bankruptcies. Uh, so this, it, it's, it's again, going up. And these are companies within the healthcare industry having to file for bankruptcy um, because, you know, the they can't make ends meet. Um, and I, I think that this is sort of fascinating to suggest that the healthcare industry is in a state of crisis right now. So, you know, it, you know, why do they close? Why do they merge? Some of it is the complexity of billing. It's too hard to, to keep your private practice going because you have to have all these people hired to engage with all these different insurance companies. And, you know, that's just a lot of work. If you join a healthcare system, they take care of all that for you. You become just a salaried doc and you can get out there and just take care of patients. Um, albeit maybe making less money, albeit having to potentially see more patients per time than, than you may have when you were in solo practice. Um, hospitals often prefer salary providers because they have more control over them, uh, over private practice contractors who are, are, you know, sort of out there doing their own thing, but but creating a contract with a hospital. Um, hospitals are closing because of this concept of payer mix. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, this is this drives mergers, right? This is the inner city hospital buying the suburban hospital because more of those suburban people have health insurance that's going to help cover those costs. Again, we talked about this yesterday, but this is the same thing that, that drove the University of Chicago to not want to take care of trauma patients because University of Chicago patients got private health insurance or Medicare. That's like three quarters. So they have guaranteed, much more guaranteed revenue compared to just serving the community. Um, of course, this also creates pipelines when you have specialists you know, you can you can get all of your cardiologists in one place, all your hemonc docs in one place to provide your cancer care. And again, that's the, the concept of an economy of scale. If everybody needs infusions, let's just get them all in the same spot. And you can uh, you can save a lot of money on that process rather than having separate places to do that all over the all over the city. So the issue really is that hospitals are bearing more financial risk and, you know, they're being forced to pay more. Insurance companies are paying less. Insurance companies 
um, are exerting a tremendous amount of control over the hospital industry. And I think that's what's driving this. And then you have for-profit hospitals rising who are, again, only going to make choices that are in the best interest of the profit that they want to make. Um, we haven't safely protected those safety net and critical access hospitals nearly enough. Um, we have such a complex healthcare system that it, it costs a tremendous amount for a hospital just to function because you've got all these different insurance companies and Medicare, and everybody has different sets of rules and different reimbursement rates and different processes for what they cover. So this complexity leads to greater expense, which of course puts them at greater financial risk. And then the thing that I talked about a little bit before, that dissociation between price and cost on their, on their charge master, on their menu. If you haven't read it, oh, this is a this is a concept I'll get to it in a second. This is a concept that I hadn't heard of until I explored this a little bit further, and that's the charge to reimbursement ratio. So this is the ratio between what the hospital charges for your appendectomy and what they actually get reimbursed. And on average for Medicare, the charge to reimbursement ratio was 3.77. So a hospital would charge $3700 for their appendectomy, but they would get reimbursed thousand dollars. That's the charge to reimbursement ratio. But if you if you have a higher ratio than that, like 10 to 1, you're more likely to be investor owned versus not for profit. You're more likely to be part of a, a hospital system, more likely to have more beds. So the bigger the hospital is, the more like the more likely they are to overcharge for stuff. Um, if you're investor owned, you're more likely to have a higher charge to reimbursement ratio for what you get paid because because you want to maximize the amount of money that you get paid. And if you have a few people that can actually pay out of pocket, man, that's a windfall. So um, factors associated with having a low charge to reimbursement ratio, being in a rural location, being academic, being government owned, um, and having more Medicaid patients. Um, and so this is another way of thinking about how hospitals profit. Um, why does this matter? Well, maybe they're potentially inflating prices. Um, each hospital's charge master is unique, so it's really hard to compare prices between hospitals. And if you've never heard of this or read it or read his long um, article in, in Time magazine, you should check this out. Stephen Brill wrote this book called America's Bitter Pill, Money, Politics, Backroom Deals, and the Fight to Fix Our Broken Healthcare System. He really dives into this disparity in what hospitals charge uh, in trying to understand how that drives how expensive things are. In America, so this was uh, this is a pretty important book that came out, an expose of how money is driving all of this. Um, you know, hospitals that don't have these really high charge charge to reimbursement ratios, why don't they have it? Because they're not in there trying to make money, right? They're just trying to get by, um, and maybe it's because they're seeing predominantly Medicaid patients. They know they're you know they're not seeing private insurance or private pay patients, just Medicaid patients. So what's the point? of jacking up your charge master. Um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily make any sense for them. At a fundamental level, the price charged by a hospital, you know, doesn't bear any relationship to the services that, that, that they provide. And so hospitals can charge whatever they want, and then they negotiate these reimbursement rates with the insurance companies. So I don't want to, you know, I say that the real problem is insurance companies are starving hospitals. And that's true. And hospitals are bearing more risk. And that's true, too. But they've also sort of worked together to make things worse, right? The, the hospital will be like, well, I'll just charge more. And then I'll negotiate with the insurance company for a higher reimbursement. And then I'll charge even more than that. The insurance company will, you know, and everybody starts charging more and more and more um, and driving the cost of healthcare up so that the money spent bears no relation to the actual cost of keeping the hospital open and taking care of the patient and paying the physicians and paying the nurses and paying the OR scrub techs or whatever. It's just gotten completely out of control. So, you know, I think profit opportunity has driven so much of this. There's this, there's a company in the United States called HCA. Um, and they are the largest for-profit hospital chain. They basically go into markets, snap up multiple hospitals and then minimize staffing and maximize profit. Um, you know, one of the ways that HCA makes money is they open residency programs because they know that residents are cheap. So they get the residents to run the hospital. It doesn't cost them very much. And and they they literally are putting them in unsafe working conditions because they're using residents 
as cheap labor. And, and this is why you're starting to see resident unions forming all over the country because they're getting abused because, uh, you know, again, for this cheap labor, not focused on their training, but focused on the fact that they can take care of patients in the hospital overnight for a quarter of the cost that it, that, that it is to actually hire a, a boarded physician. Um, you know, the, the profit opportunity, again, gets into these academic hospitals buying suburban hospitals, and that is, a, you know, a way to make more money. Um, and then the more power that you have, the more that you can set the prices to to benefit yourself rather than to think about what um you know what the healthcare system should bear and so is it any wonder that healthcare per capita in the united states is almost twice what it is for the next country down which is switzerland you know because we have these things that just drive spending up 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 and up because people are using it as an opportunity to skim profit off the top and and none of it is really related to what the cost of care actually is. Um, I liked this article. Don't blame Medicare for rising medical bills. Blame monopolies. I I, I think that that's uh, I think that's right. Um, and so to summarize, then we have fifteen minutes. If you guys want to chat some more, I think the biggest problem in the hospital sector is just the the shifting of risk onto the hospital away from the insurance company, but also the colluding that they do to 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 make profits and raise prices. Different types of hospitals are handling this differently as a function of where they get their funding, whether they're private versus public, um, the patients that they serve, academic affiliations. And I think the path that we're on is resulting in, in these growing hospital systems or even systems like United Healthcare or CVS that have monopoly power over the entire healthcare system. And again, when that's at play, their interest is solely on shareholder profits. It's not on the health of the people that they're serving. Um, yeah, it'd be great if they're out there healthy and not costing the system money. But at the end of the day, nobody's looking at how well they're caring for them. They're looking at how much they're making for people. And um, and I think that this is is a huge problem within our healthcare system. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And you're welcome to ask me ask me anything. Um, you can either put it in the chat or. Um, or just raise your hand and I'll do my best to answer. So I see Kaya first. Hello, thank you for the presentation. No um, problem. I have a question. So I guess this is more something that I've heard and I'm not exactly sure how true it is, um, but I've heard that the way some hospitals deal with a higher um, mortality rate, and this isn't in all cases, of course, um, but what they'll do is they'll take patients who they believe may die or may have a chance of dying and then they transfer them to other hospitals that are willing to take those patients is that true you know it i can imagine that exists i i didn't see that particularly when i you know in the hospitals that i've worked in i've never seen that um you know patients that are closer to death we have different ways of dealing with them. And so, so for instance, we have uh, a network of hospitals called LTACs, long-term acute care facilities. Often those are places where a hospital will, will transfer a patient that is in that sort of scenario, partly because they don't wanna keep them in the hospital. They wanna keep the hospital for patients that are acutely ill, but also because of the cost and expense there is at dealing with those. But then if you look at those LTACs, they're predominantly for-profit, um, because the docs that are there, and this I did see, they'll literally show up, they'll see a patient for like two minutes, write a note, they can bill and make a bunch of money in that context and um, and not actually have the discussion perhaps about withdrawing care for patients, right? Like if you have a patient that's, you know, permanently debilitated, doing nothing, just sitting on a ventilator, you know, maybe the time is now to have a discussion about that. But there's actually an opportunity. If you can keep them alive, you can spend five minutes with them, bill, make $200, you know, and then multiply that up. So, you know, we often shunt people to these LTACs and then that becomes a separate profit-making opportunity. And it looks, it makes the sending hospital not have to deal with those kinds of patients. So there's certainly ways in our healthcare system that that things like that can happen. I didn't see any, I was never sort of specifically directed to do that in the course of what I've done, but I could certainly imagine that it happens in other institutions. And you would you would dress it up by saying, oh, 
we don't want these patients here. They should be in a place where their families can see them more, or maybe it's closer to their, like you can find ways to get them out of your system and into another system and also reap the benefit of, of that on your mortality rates. Um, Serbi. Yeah, so my question, I'm really happy you broke down kind of the distinctions between for-profit, not-for-profit and non-profit, um, as well as how you're, you discussed how the non-profit industry is kind of focusing more on like making money rather than their charitable contributions. I had a question about like, the actual cost of like what patients pay out of pocket to these institutions um, because you know like you would think that maybe like the nonprofit institution might be cheaper but you know again if the nonprofit industry is going towards a focus on making money then are they comparable like like how, which is like more expensive from a patient perspective yeah so it's totally unpredictable because some, you know, so again, the charge master, which is what they charge the patient to pay out of pocket, that's largely determined by that, and they can charge whatever they want. And so you would think that a nonprofit might charge less because they're trying to do service to the community. But again, if they're trying to elevate the, the bill so that it looks like they're providing more charitable care, they may actually charge more. It's crazy, you know, how much you have to pay out of pocket depends on both your insurance plan and whatever the insurance plan will cover. But if you don't have insurance and you're getting the bill, the numbers are crazy. They're they're not anything that anybody could actually pay, right? Because unless you're independently wealthy, in which case you probably have health insurance. And And one of the crazy sort of secrets that nobody tells you about is that, you know, if you don't have insurance and you show up at a hospital and they give you a $100,000 bill for your ICU stay, Nine times, no, 99 times out of 100, you can actually negotiate that way down rather than going into bankruptcy court. There's a there's this whole company out there or this whole organization called Ending Medical Debt um, or Medical Debt Reversal or something like that. And they're out there buying up people's medical debt and they pay pennies on the dollar for how much people actually owe. And then the hospital is like, OK, cool. At least we got something, you know, like it's it's the system is so messed up because it's actually forcing you to we're going to just charge you a ton and then expect you to negotiate with us or to deal with one of these other debt agencies or whatever to manage your debts and nonprofits for profits everybody engages in that now one of the other things i thought was sort of interesting when i was at the university of chicago they they only got paid for about 15% of what they bill um uh, just sort of across the board and um and that means they're providing a ton of uncompensated care and it also means that like there's a total this gets back to that charge to reimbursement ratio like that they're that that like their charge to reimbursement ratio is something like 6 because they're billing 6 times more than they're actually receiving in revenue um and then then it starts to become like pretty higher order math to figure out how to keep the lights on in a hospital right so like i sort of feel for that but also no, like this is crazy. The, the you know we have a broken system if you're only getting reimbursed fifteen percent of what you're um, actually billing people. So to sum it up, you'd think that a nonprofit might might be more lenient or flexible, but there's no reason actually. There's no there's no evidence that that's actually the case, unfortunately. Sam, thanks. Thanks for this presentation. It was awesome. I had a question about like. What are the actual obligations of nonprofit hospitals? Like we talked about, they're supposed to be service oriented, but also yesterday we talked about a private hospital isn't required to accept a transfer for a higher level of care. Right. And right. like now that they're doing less charity care, I guess I was just wondering, like, what is the bare minimum in order to be a nonprofit hospital? So I think you've gotten a, at a really good, it's a lot easier for a private hospital or a nonprofit to to do the bare minimum or to not even do the bare minimum and hope that nobody finds out because the oversight that's provided over these systems is not near enough, right? So, you know, people sometimes raise this issue and they, they try and bring it to Congress and they say, Congress, look at all the money that these nonprofits are making. They're not supposed to do that. Why don't you do something about it? And Congress will say, well, it's not really our job. That's maybe CMS's job. And CMS says, well, yeah, but we don't have the resources to be able to actually enforce some of these rules or, you know, 
Uh, maybe it's JCO's job because they regulate accreditation of hospitals. Everybody sort of passes the buck, which means that the systems are like, well, we're going to either do the bare minimum or we're not even going to do the bare minimum and we'll take the slap on the wrist um, because, you know, this means that ultimately, you know, because we know that nobody has the resources to actually enforce this. And so um, it's it's kind of a sinister system, um, you know, because we create these rules for these kinds of systems and then nobody actually follows them. Um, and then I think that leads to the problems that we're in. Um, Hamza. So my question related to the different types of hospitals that you mentioned, um, to like all the safety net, critical access, is it like a recent phenomena that we have like just a plethora or is it that like all of them are just like tending towards the just like system based for profit? Um, oh, it's a, it's a recent phenomenon. I mean, this is all stuff that's happened in the last twenty five years. So, so in the last twenty five years was created the concept of critical access hospitals. For instance, they get additional and safety net hospitals that get additional money from the government to keep them afloat. And hmm. in the last twenty five years, we've seen this consolidation happening left and right uh, into forming these bigger systems. It's you know, and I think it is it is pure it's mostly driven by you can you you can say that it's driven by a bunch of different things about you know regionalization of care or whatever, but I think it ultimately is it's it's all driven by finances because um and, and that's where I think the problem is, right? Like when you have in in countries that have national health care systems, they simply allocate resources based on what the community needs because that's the rational way to do it, right? Our healthcare system isn't designed for that. Our, our healthcare system is designed to optimize revenue and to eliminate places that don't generate the revenue that you want. And the government tries to shore them up a little bit by providing, you know, additional support to critical access or, or safety net hospitals, but it's not near enough. And you're just seeing the chasm widening between um, uh, between sort of the profitable and then the safety net slash government supported and you know, how how well they function. And I think that's only going to get worse as long as we continue to let finances drive the the decision making process. We need to let health drive it and and not financial sustainability, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Steven. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation both yesterday and today. Um, it was all really good information. I mean, you know, depressingly overwhelming information, but very good for us to know. Totally. Um, so I kind of like, I have a little bit of like, I guess a random opinion question. Um, just like with all the recent hospital closures, I know it's been ongoing, but you know, recently it's been so much uh, more than ever. Like I can think here in New York city, there's one that's in the process of closing down if it hasn't already. Same back home and in Oregon, there is um, like clinics shutting down. So I guess like, are you, hopeful in a way with like how bad the closures are getting that we're on the cusp of like a boiling point of everyone being so fed up that we're going to hit like start doing major reforms or do you think this is going to be more of an ongoing slow battle as more yeah. hospitals keep closing i am